I want to welcome you to University of Laverne's Cultural and Natural History Collections Influential Voices Speakers Series, where we highlight the work of cultural influencers, thought leaders, humanitarians, and those who work for social justice. So today we are welcoming Linda Yvette Chavez in a conversation with Ann Collier, our curator, who will be talking about the theme, You Belong Here. Um, I'm also gonna be in the chat, I'm gonna be putting in our donation link, okay? So should you wanna to donate to the Cultural Natural History Collections, um, the link will be in the chat. And for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, the Cultural Natural History Collections, we're the university's museum and we're run completely on donations. So again, if you're so inclined, We'll appreciate your donation and I will put that link in the chat. But one last comment, if you have a question for Linda, please type it in the, to the, into the chat. So we've had some questions sent to us already and we've been collecting those, um, but we hope to get to all of your questions timing uh, permitting, so time permitting. And with that, we're gonna begin. So please welcome Linda Yvette Chavez and our interviewer, conversation guide, Ann Collier. And it's your turn. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Influential Voices. This is our third one that we have had so far. So I really want to welcome you, Linda. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. And I'm um, excited to be here. As anybody is aware, if they're not aware, and as Linda's aware, we've themed this that you belong here. And the reason why is because in talking with Linda, she had a wonderful story um, where she was talking. It's her origin story of where she felt in a situation that she didn't belong somewhere. And we're trying to expose that and talk about that. So any student, any adult, any person who's ever felt like they didn't belong somewhere or currently don't feel that way or they have imposter syndrome, that's what we're trying to talk to today to influence others to realize that no matter where you are, if you're there, you belong there. So Linda, if you could talk about your story, let's, let's get the conversation going. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, I am the co-creator, uh, executive producer, one of the writers of the series Hymnified. Um, so I have had a long journey to get to this place um, of being able to create the, the beautiful things that I do. Uh, but it wasn't always like that. So I think, you know, growing up, I grew up writing little short stories and poems and things like that. And I never thought that that would be a career for me. I grew up um, Mexican-American. My parents are both from Mexico. My mom from Juarez, my dad from Michoacan. And I grew up in a low-income immigrant family um, with a lot of challenges and things that came our way. And so I grew up very much wanting to make money because um, I was like, I, I need to, you know, get out of this circumstance and help my family get out of the circumstance. Um, and so I thought, I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to go go to college. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to do all these these things that sounded like they needed to be the things I need to do in order to live what I thought was the American dream. Eventually, you know, I worked really hard, probably too hard um, through high school, and I ended up getting into Stanford University. So that's where I went for undergrad. Um, and it, it could not be more different than the life that I had been leading up to that point. I had grow grown up in a predominantly Lat Latinx, Latine, um, community that was mixed income status, but definitely not what I was encountering at Stanford. The first morning we got there, though, um, we got there hella early because my dad's a ranchero. He gets up at the crack of dawn. And so we were there before the sun was up um, as the workers were coming into the school. And if you've ever been there, and I don't know how it is now because this was a while ago, um, but, you know, the majority of the people who work there were coming in were people of color. Most of them were Latine. Um, Latino. And I um, remember, you know, sitting in our little van, my entire family came with me, all six of us watching all the workers come in and seeing them and thinking, wow, they look like my family. Um, many hours later, because like I said, we were there hella early. Um, <laughs> we went to go check into to my freshman dorm. And um, as I saw people checking in, I noticed that the people checking in didn't look like my family. They very much were predominantly white um, or um, a higher class status than what I had ever experienced. And I remember thinking that it felt really weird. It felt very strange. And as we came up the elevator together, I, I remember thinking this, is, this isn't right. It shouldn't be like this. Like, how do we change this? Um, I had no consciousness at the time. I hadn't been politicized in any way at that time. I just knew that something felt wrong in my heart and I felt like I didn't belong there. 
Um, that first year was definitely an extension of all of that. I spent the first year very depressed, very much feeling like this was not the place for me. And, um, you know, I had gone from being top of my class to really struggling in that first year where, where students who were there had learned all the text in the re- original Latin in high school. And I was like, yo, what? Like, how did you all do that? It was a very trying time because, you know, it's the cream of the crop at a university that's already the cream of the crop. Um, and I spent the year not really knowing who I was or where I was going. But towards the end of it, we all signed up or had the opportunity to sign up for a program right before our sophomore year called Sophomore College. And when I went through the guide, um, because I was still an overachiever, I was still trying to do my best. I saw a course called Social Protest Theater. I never heard of anything like that before. It was being taught by Harry Elam, who was um, uh, probably one of the only black professors at the time at at Stanford. He, He ran the theater department. And the names and the voices and the stories that were just this little blurb description, I was just like something about it just had never, I had never seen it before. It was black and brown uh, playwrights and, and filmmakers. And I just thought, wow, like, what is this? What is this thing? And I signed up for it. And when I took it at the beginning of my so- sophomore year, it was the first time I would say I was very clearly exposed to work by people who looked like me. Um, and it was work that was speaking to, um, to things that like I had experienced myself but had no words for, you know, oppression, like racism, family dynamics, obviously I was supposed to people like Spike Lee, August Wilson, and then the the one that made the biggest impact in my life was Sheree Moraga, who is a queer Chicana playwright, um, who had done this play called Giving Up the Ghost. And I read that play during that time. And when I read it, it was the first time I saw between the pages, my family. And I didn't know that you could write about your family. And so I had grown up telling my parents and my parents actually wanted me to be, they were like, you're, you're a writer. And yeah, I think you're gonna be a writer. And I was like, there's a saying in Spanish that goes, por eso estamos como estamos, which means like, that's why we are the way we are. That's why we're broke. I was like, I'm not gonna be a writer. I'm gonna be a lawyer. I'm gonna make a lot of money. Um, but after that course, I thought, well, I think I'm gonna be broke because I love writing. And I discovered Sheree Moraga was a, was a professor there and ended up what I say, quote unquote, I, I say I majored in Sheree because I took all of her classes during that time, um, but I did end up majoring in comparative studies and race and, race and ethnicity with a focus in literature and the arts and communities of color. And um, yeah, that's that's the origin of this this person right here. So an elective changed your your plans. It was an elective class. Yeah, it was the short two week course right before the beginning of our sophomore year. It was, it's a, I think they still do it actually. Um, and it was just, to, it's a kind of like an elective in the sense that you got to explore something that you had would have never pre- probably would have wanted to explore before. It was just a, a good little like taste test of something. And it, listen, it worked because I taste tested it and was like, hey, I want to do this. This is cool. And I, th- I think that that's perfect for students that come here and they have to declare at age 18 and half times or come to any college. And they don't really know what they want to be at age 18 and they ex- get exposed to different ideas and subjects. And, you know, here you knew what you wanted to be and you ended up changing your course anyhow. And I, I think students need to know or people in life need to know it's OK to change your mind. It's, it's OK. Oh, my God. Change your mind. 18. Girl, change your mind at, at- 25, 30, 40, I'm sure there's people at 70, 80 changing their mind. There is never a time that you become the fully formed person that you are. You are a constantly evolving human being. Like we are part of nature. We are nature and we are changing every single day. I think the most freeing thing that you will ever know for yourself, and I hope you know it as early as college, is that you are not you are not tied to any decision you make. You are your own autonomous person. You get to say no when something doesn't feel right anymore. You get to say yes when something does feel right. You get to change constantly, whether that's at 18 or at 75. Like there is no um, prison that you're locked into because you are your own person. You may feel that way because others might put the burden of their own expectations on you, but it is not your job to carry their expectations. You are your own person. You're living your own life. And I think that that is, probably one of the biggest discoveries for me, not only in college, but throughout life that I've, I've found that even when sometimes things seem incredible to other people, but they're crushing you inside and you have to realize that it's not for you. It might be cool to them. Awesome. Let them do it. Right. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to carry the responsibility of fulfilling a dream that someone else has. Like you have to see what makes you tick, what makes you happy, and then chase that with all of your might. 
So you were saying that, you know, in your family, they were saying you're going to be a writer and you were saying you were going to be a lawyer. How did the family react when you changed your mind or you changed your path? Oh, they were like, yeah, of course, <laughs> you're going to be a writer. They, it's funny because I think a lot of um, immigrant children have a very different uh, journey. Actually, one of the characters in the show, Anna, struggles with her mother, who is constantly telling her not to chase her artistic dreams. And, and that's a very um, common narrative for a lot of immigrant children, children of immigrants or immigrant children. And I think for me, it was a very unique scenario where my parents, and I don't know if maybe my parents did think I could make money being a writer, but they were definitely the opposite of what I think you expect. And I, I've always been that type A kind of kid who um, was always like parenting when she didn't need to be parenting. It was always the one saying like, I know what we got to do and this is what's best. And, um, and I think they just knew, I don't know, in their hearts that my talent was there and um, so when, when I did tell them I'm going to be a writer, they're like, yeah, we know, of course you are. And, and every time that I faltered and then stepped away from this career, because it has happened, I've stepped away from this career and said, I don't know that I can do this anymore. They've listened. They've heard me. They've said, okay, we support you, Miha, whatever you need. They've been always very supportive. They've been loving. And every time I come back or I would come back to it, it was always like, yeah, of course, like this is, this is your calling. This is who you are. And and I think that that's been very, you know, I'm very blessed in that sense because I know not everybody has that. And I, I am very, the career that I have is so difficult that to have that in my life has been very grounding and, and blessed, blessed, uh, blessing. So, okay, talking about your type A personality, you know, you and I discussed this before. There's a lot of students here that in high school, they were very type A, they, they excelled, they did really well and they went on to college, but their students, their friends, are left behind. They didn't go to college. They're typically a first gen or just in their area. Yeah. It wasn't talked about in high school. I know the high school I went to, if you weren't in sports, you were a nobody. I mean, they would talk college, but it was mm -hmm. all about sports. So yeah. for those students that come here and at home, they don't have anyone to talk to because no one in their family went to college and none of their friends went to college. And then they go to college and the students that they're, they're our peers with can play video games until the morning or their parents send them money because they don't want them to, they want them to stay focused on their schooling. But these students that straddle the two different worlds that are working at home, but they're coming here and they're, they're going full time, you know, in that situation where, you, did you ever struggle with that or did you ever see anyone or how to overcome that? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, I definitely, you know, I was the, I was right after my sister, I was the second one in my family to go to college. I was the first one to go to grad school, but I was the first one to move away from home and, and, and leave and go live in a different place and um, kind of live my life on my own. So it was very isolating and very scary. Like I said earlier, it was an environment in which like I had never been in before. And so I oh, didn't know the people didn't feel, sorry, say it again. Stanford would scare me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was very isolating. So I think that like, you know, and on top of that, um, I was working like three to four jobs to help pay my own um, things. You know, my parents did everything they could to support me in within their means and their means were very, were meager, you know, they didn't have a lot. Um, and so I had to pay for my books, I had to pay for my clothes, I had to pay for any like extra food beyond my like lunch meal plan and all those things. And so I was doing, I was working to pay for all of those things and it was exhausting. It was really exhausting to have a full course load. Like I said, I'm type A and so I had those legs, I don't know, it was like 16 units, something crazy. It's been a while, but it was a lot of classes, a lot of jobs. And, you know, I, I noticed that not everyone around me was having to do that because like I mentioned before, you know, Stanford, there's a lot of folks in a higher class status and, um, you know, their parents were paying for everything. So they got to just focus on school. Um, and then beyond that, not only the, the, the work, but you're also thinking about the struggles that your families are going through often because for me, coming from an immigrant intergenerational family, you often are participating in the problems that are happening within your family and you're having to carry all of those things. So in some ways coming back home, yes, there's, there's that, that distance, that isolation of feeling like my community, people in my community don't understand my struggle or my journey. Um, but then on the flip side, being at school, there's people at school who also don't understand your journey and your struggle, and they don't understand that you're carrying the load of so many things. And, and sometimes often you have to talk to your professors and they don't fully grasp like what you're really dealing with. And, and what you're having to manage and how many things you're having to manage. And 
Um, and that's difficult. It's challenging in a lot of ways. And, and being able to find community that helps you through that. And I mentioned earlier, Sharia, I ended up taking so many classes with her. And a big part of it was because of the community that was formed there. The people in those classes were people like me. They had all been drawn to her work and to her way of teaching and to her art and writing because it was catharsis. It was being, it was like group therapy, all through all of us showing up there with our own immigrant stories. And we were from various backgrounds, like Indian American, like Mexican American, all the things, um, queer, not queer, all the things. And, and we were able to sit in community and really process a lot of our own things and, and feel not alone and feel yeah. safe in those environments and you know and that's why it's so important to have community centers and to have like um I, I'm not sure how, what it is at La Burn, but at our at our school we had the Chicano El Centro Chicano which like was a, such a community space for us all and um it's vital because when you have people who understand your journey be able to connect with you I mean like I I, I compare it to being a showrunner in this industry as a woman of color like I have this group called the Untitled Latinx Project, which is a group of um, Latina showrunners and higher level um, writers. And even at, at this stage in my life and career, we're all in community. We're all on a text thread talking about like the things we're struggling with that's specific to our experience in this, in this industry um, that only they could understand. Only another showrunner can understand the, the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into creating a show. And I think at every stage of your life, whether it's college or later down the line, you need community and someone who can relate to what you're going through. It doesn't mean that the people who love you, who aren't, who haven't experienced what you're experiencing, um, aren't also important to your journey, but having someone who can like pinpoint and, and share in, in conversation with you about a struggle or a challenge, like it's hard to explain what that feels like. So seek out those spaces, seek out those people because it's really priceless. And it's one of the things that has helped me persevere it's something that my therapist calls the um like your board of directors in life like who are your board of directors in your life who are the people you have set up to go to to ask for their advice for your life's decisions like hey I'm going through this thing and these people the board of directors have the different pieces of the puzzle to give you to say hey Linda I know you in this way and here are the things about it and what are you thinking and and to be able to have that in your life is so crucial for success it's so crucial for for um elevating yourself and your career, whether it's personal or, or um, business. So, okay, so you found a community and you reached out to them, but you also started your own community. How'd you start, how'd you start your own group? Um, are you talking about the ULP that I just described? The yeah. title wow. So you- I didn't start that group. So that that's very recent, that is maybe two, almost three years now. Tania Sarracho, who is also a Latina showrunner who is the creator of Vida, Um, reached out to a a bunch of close friends um, in the industry and said, hey, I want to bring this group together. I want a space to like, to talk to people and to have conversation. And, um, and I said, yes, because I was like, of course, like, I want to be able to be in that conversation and also be able to support each other. And like the the waves that we've made since, you know, started out as us just wanting to support each other. Now we've become an advocacy group. We just released a letter for Dear Hollywood to demanding the, the industry make more drastic changes for, for representation for Latinx people in the industry. We've like uh, created initiatives and, and labs with, with different organizations in the industry to give opportunities to Latino and other uh, BIPOC uh, writers so that they have the opportunity to grow in their careers. Um, and that all came from us just wanting to get together and like, like, complain about everything <laughs> that we were going through and have support and often we talk about like you know skincare routines sometimes and then like hey who, who are you who's who are you seeing for this doctor but all of that together like becomes the community that you need to, in order to get through because then there's a moments where you you talk to each other and you're like struggling through something very difficult that you're experiencing and, and that's really what that community is there for like you're in conversation so that when those hard things hit you have you have it there for you. But I think over the years, like I've definitely reached out to people. I mean, speaking up um, and reaching out to people is a big thing. And I think in college, remembering college, it's a very, you you don't have the, you're scared to ask. You're scared to, to, to admit vulnerability. You're scared to admit that life is hard for you too. And I will tell you right now, the minute that you are vulnerable with the right people, like, you know, you have to make sure you seek the right people out too. The minute you're vulnerable with the right people, um, it's like such a relief, such a weight off your shoulders to feel that community and that communion. Um, and it just, 
that alone takes so much shame away from what you're feeling. And, and I think in college in particular, there's a lot of like fear and shame and like you're growing into this world and you're by yourself sometimes for the first time. And it's like, it's terrifying. It's freaking terrifying. Like, of course, of course you're, you're, you don't, it's hard to admit like, hey, I'm struggling, especially if you're the kid from high school who had it all together and you were top of your class. And suddenly you're like, not like, how do you admit to quote unquote failure? And the reality is it's not failure. It's just life. It's the, it's the, it's facing challenges and it's growth. It's so much around growth. And I think that, that's another big thing that I've done over the years is look up people's like, fail quote unquote failures you know like the people that I admire like seeing what they've gone through the, the number of times that they had to do something to get back on their feet and then it reminds me like oh that's right everybody's human like everybody's human and like there's nothing that you should be ashamed of and finding the right people you can be vulnerable with can help heal and um and remove some of that shame it's, it's hard when I have students that'll talk to me about, you know, all the struggles they're going through. And I, I keep telling them how far ahead of the game they are dealing with adversity. They don't want the adversity. And I understand that. But they're so far ahead of the game having to deal with it at their young age than people who, you know, experience these setbacks in their 30s or 40s. It, but it is hard. It is when you've got a lot on your plate and you're going to college to have an adult go, oh, but you're ahead of the game, you know, but... <laughs> say <laughs> no because you know sometimes it's like in the, and I get that part too so like you can be ahead of the game and still feel yeah. there's like, something like in your struggle mm-hmm. yeah like you're dr- drowning because sometimes it's it's not even the things that you're doing there's this one particular thing that like might be the struggle or like you know as you're as you were talking I was reminded of like oftentimes in immigrant families, like, you know, talking about feelings is not taught, like it's not the therapy is taboo. Um, discussing our fears is taboo, being able to sit down with our parents and really have these heartfelt, open right. conversation. That's something that I had to work on over the years with my parents and like, we're there now, but, you know, being able to form that type of relationship and conversation is so difficult, especially when you're that young, and you're still trying to figure it out for yourself. Like, how do I teach my parents how to like, have a open, vulnerable com- conversation. And, and it's hard. It's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to have that conversation. And I think, again, seeking out those spaces in other areas first is, is a great first step. Apologize for my puppy who I took out before this, but she decides she has been deciding all week to cry during my interviews. Um, so I apologize. So when you're talking about the taboo, there's also that, you know, you're weak if you go for therapy, but you're not weak if you're seeking out help and, and you, it's not, it's not a weakness when you're trying to figure yourself out. And we have a lot of students here who, like you're saying, maybe they trust the wrong source or maybe they don't know the right outlet. You know, you've been in therapy, you've mentioned it a couple of times. What would be the, what would be a thing that you would say to a student on to reach out to, or to just ignore everybody else's voices and just listen to your own voice. Yeah. I mean, like, I think first and foremost, like seeking a space to be able to be vulnerable is number one. And I do think therapy is such a safe space. And I'll say why, I mean, back in the day when I first started, it was probably a little bit more difficult, but now I think there's so many resources online and via phone and obviously at your school, but, um, First and foremost, knowing that it's a journey is like kind of like dating, um, getting it there, which I know dating sucks, y'all. So like, but it's okay. Like, it's, you know, you're trying to find the right person for you, um, the right therapist for you, who's going to make you feel like it's a, giving you some sort of relief or healing in some way. And I think the reason why I think therapy in particular is great for, especially for those of us who've grown up in immigrant families, where we often carry the burden of um, being the strong one in the family um, and keeping it together, especially if you're in college and you're going for it, like you, you're, you're trying to be the strong one for your family. You're going to help everyone out and it's going to be great. I think in a, <clears throat> in a therapeutic uh, situation, you get to let go and this person gets to be there just for you. You don't have to carry their wow. issues. You don't have to carry their burdens. You don't have to think about, is this hurting them? If I'm saying X, Y, Z, um, they are there just for you, literally being paid just to be there for you. And like, if that's the only gift you're able to give yourself at this point, then that's beautiful. When I started my journey, that's something I would tell myself over and over again, because it was such a painful experience in the beginning. Um, it's this thing I, what, one of the 
the enlightened gurus that I follow very on in my journey. She's passed since, but she's very famous. Louise Hay would say um, that when you are first going through the healing process, it's like a very dirty pan, a very dirty pan in the, in the, in the sink and you're washing and you're scrubbing and it's really gross and disgusting in the beginning, right? And then by the end of it, it's like clean and pristine. That's therapy. In the beginning, it's real ugly and it's real dirty. And you're getting all the grime out and it's really painful. Um, and I think that that, that that beginning experience, it's there. But one of the things I would tell myself often as I was going to therapy was, you know, I cannot, because I was in a very difficult, dark place at the time. I was like, there's no, I, I, it's really hard for me to do anything right now. But the one thing I can do is give myself the gift of therapy. The one thing I could do is like show up to this session once a week for one hour. And if I can do that, then at least I've done something for myself. And that's the most I can do. If that's the most love I'm able to muster for myself, then that's the love I'm going to give myself. Because everything else outside of that, I was struggling. I was struggling to give myself any of that love. But I was like, if all I got to do is show up to this painful ass therapy session, fine, this is what I'm going to show up to. And then eventually, like I said, the, the, the pan got, got cleaner and cleaner. And, and every now and then I use the pan, so it gets dirty and I got to clean it again. But um but I think that like finding a space to be vulnerable and sometimes, you know, therapy might not be the entry point for you. You might need time to get to that place. Um, but there are other healing modalities that can get you there. And you have to kind of seek out what those are for you. It could be EMDR, it could be Reiki, it could be a spiritual healer, a healer it could be a group session with some friends. It could be um, reading a self-development book that, that feels safe for you to read. Like all of those things are entry points into your self-love journey and your self-healing journey. Um, it doesn't have to be one way for any one person. Like I said earlier, we're all different human beings. It's going to work differently for all of us. So don't put the burden on yourself of like, I have to do it the perfect way. I have to go to therapy. I have to do X, Y, Z. Yes, maybe, maybe that, but maybe it's not working for you. You need to go this way now first, and then you'll come back to it. Like whatever it may be, be gentle with yourself be kind to yourself. Being gentle with yourself. That's like the big one. Like be gentle with yourself because who else is going to be that for you? It's not you, you know, like, and it's like, it's the, the saying that I, I think people have heard, but talk to yourself like you would to a child that is learning how to walk. If a child tripped and fell, you wouldn't be like, oh my God, you're awful. You little baby. How dare you fall on the ground? Look at how you messed up. Like you wouldn't berate this little baby, right? You would say, okay, great job. Great try. What's next? Um, do that for you. You're that baby. Like you never stop being that child who's learning how to walk. So how do you be that voice for yourself who's gentle and kind to yourself? And, and trust me, that voice that changes within you, oh, it's night and day once you start to, to really be that person for yourself. Let's go back to, let's segue back to that journey. So let's say you've now graduated from college. So we have students that graduate in a degree that probably didn't even want anyhow. Journey from there. Like, how did you go from Stanford to where you are now? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. So once I graduated college, I was like, what is happening? <laughs> what is life? Wow. I'm, not in, I'm not in the nest. I'm not in the womb of Stanford, beautiful little space that was like protecting me from the world, the real world. Um, I got, you know, launched into the real world and had to kind of process what that was. Um, and at the gate, like for undergrad, I, like I mentioned, I studied literature in the arts and communities of color, but my, I was did a lot of work in um, playwriting and, and uh, prose. So I thought I was going to either write books or I was going to write plays. Um, so I ended up taking a gap year and, and doing, not a gap year, but post-graduating before going to graduate school, I took a year to um, explore working for a theater company in Los Angeles called the Latino Theater Company. Um, at the um, LATC, the Los Angeles Theater Center in downtown. Um, and I got to help run uh, the office there. And it was a really cool experience with all these Chicano old school folks from back in the day who, who led a lot of like the first waves of gorgeous like theater and then the Latino community and the Chicano community. And I got to learn from people like Jose Luis and um, Evelina Fernandez and and just, it was a great time. It was an awesome time to be there and to learn a lot. And um, during that time, I decided to, to apply for graduate school. And I was applying to all of these different, <coughs> excuse me, programs, all in prose, all in fiction writing or nonfiction writing. And I applied to USC film school. Not, I, you know, I want to say kind of on a whim, but not really. It was really like this lifelong dream that I thought wasn't really a thing or possible. 
Yeah. Um, but I but I applied to the screenwriting program and I thought, okay, maybe. And I remember my application because I didn't know how to use final draft at the time. I didn't have the money to buy it. And so I typed up my little script that they had us do in Word. And if you're a screenwriter, like that's it's horrible. Like trying to format your little script in in Word in Word document is just like insane. But I did it. I sat there and I sent my application in and I just waited and and before I knew it, the 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 acceptances were coming in and then the one from USC came in and I'll never forget I was actually staying with my parents at the time and my little brother walked in and and he and I had grown up loving TV and film together and talking about how we were gonna make movies someday. And he walked in with my like package from USC and was like, sister, I think you got in. And I was like, I just sat there like frozen, like, oh my God, okay, what? And I just knew in that moment, I was like, oh, my life's about to change because I had never, even though I had had that dream as a child, I don't think any part of me inside thought I was actually going to be able to do it. And so when I got that acceptance, I realized like, oh, wow, this is, this is it. Like, that's the thing that I actually wanted to do this whole time. And here I am. And I said, yes. And then I went to USC and then that was a whole other thing because that was a whole other culture shock for me that was really difficult and hard and um, its own thing. And that was a two year program. And then from there, um, I did, you know, screenwriting, studied screenwriting there and then ended up um, doing some of my first short films straight out of grad school. I was directing at that time and writing and and then from there went on a million. I don't know if you want me to go all the way down the, the storyline, but I went in a million different directions in terms of the type of work that I did. And it all eventually led me to, to Henthified. But I don't know if you want me to go down that path. I think that's what students don't realize. I think they think you graduate and you have a degree and you're just going to get a job. And, and there's networking and there's reaching out. And there's different, trying on different jobs and different positions. And so, you know, I'm assuming you yeah. had to that too. Yeah, no. So I was going to say, do you want to hear the, the part where I did all the different million jobs? Okay, great. So I did a million different jobs. Um, and all of it was in the industry, but I did a lot of producing. I spent some time working for assistant to the producers of a, a documentary film called Made in LA, which eventually won an Emmy, actually. Um, so I got, yeah, I got PBS. Yes, yeah, so CBS, I worked for Almudena Carracedo and uh, Robert Behar, and I was their okay. assistant straight out of college at a grad school. Well, actually, I think it was their assistant as grad school was ending. And then for that first year after grad school, I was sitting with them while I was doing my short films and helping them with their film. And I learned so much from them and their producing and working with the editor there. Actually, one of the editors, I'm forgetting her, Lisa, Lisa Lehman is actually a professor at USC. And I like got in to speak at her class since then, but I was like a, just a little assistant trying to like help her out during that time. And um, I learned a lot of, yeah, I learned a lot about producing from, from Robert and from Amo. And, and then from there, um, I believe I went back to, to the Latino Theater Company. This was a long time ago, so I'm trying to remember all the jobs, but I went back to the Latino Theater, Com theater Company, ran their like student theater program, like helped with a lot of, helped write a, a, a grant. I, I was in the nonprofit world for a minute and helped write a grant to help them secure the theater center, which now is still there, that they're still like kind of, they're still doing theater there all these years later. And then I also uh, worked at KCET for some time as a associate producer, as a PA, production assistant person. I became associate producer and a, a researcher and I worked as a booth PA, which is a little bit different. I worked with the director and the assistant director and the, in the booth as we were doing live tapings, I learned. Um, it was for a lifestyle uh, program called uh, A Place of Their Own, which was for kids. Like uh, it was also on PBS, KCT PBS. Um, so I learned a lot about producing some more there. And then I did a bunch of like just odd jobs in different places. I remember at one point I ended up working at like a dog company. <laughs> I worked for this dog company that sold dog vitamins because um, I just needed a job and I was writing copy for them. It was a writing gig and I was writing copy for their website, which was kind of fun because I got to do the, one of their websites. I got to write from the perspective of dogs, which was really fun. I got to write little characters um, and I just did like a million things. And then at some point, one of my best friends decided to start a company called Comediva, which was a, a female driven comedy network. And she asked me to start the company with her and another friend, Emily. Um, and the three of us started this company called Comediva. And it was, uh, it was really a space for us because we had all gone to film school and we all wanted to make our, our work. We wanted to write and direct and produce things. And it had been so difficult in the industry to find a way in. 
And so we got together, we started this company and it was female driven. And so we really focused on uplifting female comedians and female creators and it actually grew. We ended up having clients like Univision and, and uh, Nickelodeon. And, and we really came about during the wild, wild west of the digital era. And so we knew how to make things go viral. And so all these big networks were like, okay, teach us how to teach us your ways. And, and we ended up starting a bunch of stuff for them. And that was a five year journey. Um, and all of these things, all of this time, all this time I'm doing producing, I'm doing directing, I'm doing um, logistical things. And like the whole time I'm realizing like I'm not really writing. Um, at Comedy, I was writing a little bit, but it was not to the extent that I wanted to be writing. And it, and I had help bring in Univision and I realized it was because I really wanted to create Latino content. It was something I'd always wanted to do for my community. It was always a part of, like I said, a part of my, a part of my origin story. And so at Comedy, but towards the end of my time there, realize oh I'm not doing what I love to do I keep being in the orbit of what I love to do I would say like that's a big lesson like if you find yourself in the orbit of what you really want to do but you're not doing the thing you really want to do it's because you're terrified of doing it and are you are you allowing yourself the freedom to be imperfect to go into that space and to work in it and so when comedy though when we came to the end of that that um, time which was a beautiful time in my life it came to an end for me because I was like, I want to, I want to tell stories about my community and I want to do TV and I want to do movies. Like that's what I started out this journey wanting to do. And I've lost my way and how do I get back to it? And so I left the company and I started to get back to my writing and one particular feature that I, that I had been, had written actually in grad school that had been my babies called Fieras about my grandmother and my aunts and um, I, I wanted to make it and I applied to a bunch of labs with it and this is actually the funny one I was saying earlier about how I left the industry this funny part about this is that I applied and the first program I applied to was a Sundance screenwriting lab and it was the first rejection I got and I don't know why it was a straw that broke the camel's back but I was like peace I'm out of this industry I can't do this anymore I've been working for years I've been having doors closed in my face like it was just something that broke me for some reason and I decided I was like I'm gonna go be a travel blogger <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna forget this I'm gonna do this and I went through the journey of actually telling my family and my friends and it was a very existential process of like you know this is not for me anymore I'm gonna move on I'm gonna do a different different thing because this is you know I just have died I've tried I've tried and then a few months later I forgot that I had applied to other things and I got into the film independent screenwriting lab and I'll never forget when they called me to tell me because I knew they were calling to tell me I got in and the phone was ringing and ringing and I just like stared at it and I didn't answer which is not the reaction you think you would get from someone trying to get into like a prestigious lab but I was like but I already left the industry I can't go I can't do this I left I'm not doing this anymore um but I'm a very spiritual person and I kind of had told my my grandmother that the script is based on who has passed um in the universe I was like you know, if you all want this script to get made like it's on, on your hands I, I, I'm exhausted I'm tired I can't do this you guys do it and lo and behold I get into this lab with this script and I think okay well let me give this one last shot I was like Linda if this is if this is really what you want to do do this lab see how it goes see how you feel and I did, I did the screenwriting lab at Film Independent and it was the most life nourishing artistic experience that I had had in many years. And by the end of it, I said, okay, this is it. You need to give writing everything you have. Cause I had felt like I hadn't up to that point, hadn't given it all that I could really give it. And I was like, I, you need to focus just on writing and writing alone and like give it everything you have in you. And, you know, if at the end of that, you still haven't done anything, then 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 fine then you can leave and feel at peace but not until you do that and at the end of that lab uh, Francisco Velasquez who runs the the Project Involved program at Film Independent had reached out to me to talk about my script and at the end of that brunch he was like hey um so I have this guy who's like trying to do this this digital series like it's about like Latinos in Boyle Heights he's like looking for a Chicana writer my first question was like is it paid and he was like yeah it's paid I was like, all right, I'll look into it. 
and it was Marvin. It was Marvin Lemos, who's my co-creator for Hentified in the project. Was Hentified. It wasn't called Hentified at the time, but he read Fiera as the script again that had been rejected that I had prayed to my grandmother to, and and he fell in love with the script, and he was like, "Listen, like." we'll talk about the show, but who's directing the script? <laughs> and I was like, he was, he was, I was like, but I thought we were, he's like, yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about that. But first, first let's talk about this. Um, but then it led to us, you know, he brought me on to the series. He was like, I want the voice that I see in the script. I want that to be a part of this series. I want us to work together to make this. And we spent four, my, four months writing the digital series. And from there, like I said, I gave him my all. And here we are, season two just dropped this past week. So um that's that's really the journey of how I got here I was wondering that when you said the digital source if it came from that's how you started off with Marvin but now I found out it came out afterwards but it's amazing like a lot of people don't realize if you go through a side door you went through a side door and then now you're knocking down the doors whereas before trying to knock down the doors that's difficult and I don't think people realize anything in life is not easy you just have to keep going or you you know do side jobs like you did you become a travel blogger and then you decide, oh, I'm going back in. I'm going to try it one more time. And, and it's great that you tried it one more time because look what came out of it. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say to that time. Yeah. That time that I left. Nothing's ever. Everything's always for a reason. And I think that time that I left taught me that I can say no. Like going back to what we said earlier in this conversation, like I can say no and I can leave at any time nothing right. and I will be okay I will survive I survived it and I felt like when coming back into the industry I came back in very clear about like I could say no to anything and I can be my most authentic self in any room because I know I can walk away from this and be okay like that, that really gave me this fortitude that I didn't I don't think I would have had otherwise you know that authentic self that's one of my um, favorite quotes out of beggar vance you know the whole authentic self be yourself kind of person and I, I love yeah. when he uses even that line, just, just be genuine, just be you. And like you said earlier, if you're imperfect, you're imperfect. Okay. People, yeah. people relate to imperfect people. They don't relate to perfect people. At least I don't. No. You know? And if no, you and I mean, relate, nobody's I perfect. Nope. No one's perfect. Like there's no <laughs> world. Lots of questions for you, it looks like. Oh, great. So let's start. Maybe Listen, right I'm blind. Okay, so I'm jumping in right now. I don't They're know if you can this is this is Felicia, and uh, I don't know if you can see me or not. Probably not. Yes, you can. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for joining us today. But everybody, do not go away just yet because questions are coming, and that's important. So think of this as a very brief interlude. I won't take that much time. But this is Felicia Beardsley. I'm the director of the Cultural Natural History Collections. And I wanna thank Linda for agreeing to be our speaker on this series of influential voices. But I have a huge thank you to go out to June Polcini who brainstormed this series and who provided the first seed funding for this series. Also today we are funded in part by the California Humanities Relief Grant Program. So yay, finally, a little, a little bit more money coming in. But I also want to thank Ann Collier, our conversation guide and curator of the collections, to Randy Miller, our speaker series coordinator, to Lucera Rojo, our university advancement connection. And we're going to be doing this again in the spring, although we're still working on, on the speaker to invite, right? And for those of you who are new to us, the Cultural Natural History Collections is the original museum of the uh, original museum of the university, and we have been around since 1891, so 130 years. We currently house nearly 100,000 objects that represent the history of our planet, literally. But our key point is that we are run solely and completely on donations, without financial support from the university, because they're busy supporting our students. Um, so again, if you're inclined, please, uh, please donate. Um, and it's really the generosity of everybody that allows us to con continue to meet our mission, which is the care and conservation of the collective history of our world and to foster shared experiences like this one um, that really we see resonating across generations and kind of help us envision a more united community. Um, so once again, Thank you for joining us and 
Let's get to those questions. So, um, okay. Pantified breaks barriers in that it's unafraid to show uh, Latina and diversity. So the whole community, the diversity of the community, the, you know, the queer community, how was Hentified received by the producers at Netflix? Good. I mean, I think they were, it's crazy because actually Hentified, it's a wild ride that we went on. We actually prepped a pitch for like five months, Marvin and I, right before the digital series came out at Sundance in 2017. Sundance. Um, then we went. Dance. So is it again? So look at that. You got into Sundance. Yes, you know, it's funny. I'm actually going to be a mentor at the screenwriting lab this January, which awesome. I find to be such a funny full circle. That's um, it's but... a full circle. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah, I uh, um, so we ended up pitching it to 10 networks straight out of after Sundance. And we actually ended up getting seven offers, which is we didn't realize was like a crazy thing that doesn't often happen. And we went into a bidding oh. war and ended up at Netflix, and, um, which is really beautiful. Um, so, you know, people wanted this, people felt very excited about the story. And then I think also excited about Marvin and I as creators and kind of the refreshing kind of perspective that we had coming into it. We were pretty fearless. Like I always joke that he and I are cocky mother efforts. Like we walk into the spaces really feeling this confidence, but I, but I think it's because we've been through so much and have faced so much, so much, um, rejection and challenge in that way, at least for me that like, for me, it was that authenticity again of coming into space saying like, I don't care what you want or are looking for. This is what this is. And if you want this and like, we're perfect for each other. But if you don't, then we're not. It's like dating again. It's like, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with me. We just don't belong together. We were lucky that like, we were the popular girl in town and everybody wanted to date us, which was really beautiful and nice. I think once we were at Netflix, obviously there's always going to be like questions around like, our choices for certain things like casting or, you know, storylines, things like that. And, and we were blessed to have executives at um, Netflix who were always very supportive and welcoming and understood what we were trying to do. And in any conversation, when conversation, conversation, the conversations in which they disagreed with us, um, you know, we always had a very thoughtful conversation. And by the end of it, they always let us have our, our, let us make our decision. Like it's a very creator driven network. Um, and so they really allowed us to drive the, the conversation. Um, and at the end, if we really wanted something our way, then they let us have it. Um, so that was a blessing. And I think, you know, we had the, you know, had a lot of conversations that a lot of unconscious biases here and there that are, I think, inevitable in any space that you walk into. Um, everyone's always well-meaning and you have to kind of uh, navigate those spaces and navigate those biases as best you can. And yeah, there's days when it's frustrating and you're overwhelmed. And then there's days where you're like, okay, well, it is what it is. And this is something I've had to deal with my whole life. And how do I navigate this here now in this moment and figure that out? It's not how it should be. It shouldn't be like that. That's not always fair, but it is what it is. And so, um, you know, we've had our challenges, but I think when you're a showrunner, when you're a creator, you have to, when you're an artist with a vision, like you have to have a certain type of conviction with your work. You have to believe in, in it more than anybody else does so that you can then, you know, deliver that vision with so much um, love and commitment that the people who hear you are like, okay, me too. I want to get on that train with you and, and make this thing. And, and that's leadership. It's being a good leader and really, really displaying that vision for everyone involved. And communicating that vision of what we were trying to communicate with the story. So, so I have a question because I'm, I'm ignoring the next question. It's my own question. Who chose to put Boyle Heights um, another character? Because I love Boyle Heights. So you're from Norwalk and Marvin's from Bakersfield and I know there is gentrification going in in Boyle Heights, but it's its own living, breathing character. And I love that. So who chose that location? It actually started with Marvin. He had visited the, he grew up in, in Bakersfield around the LA area and then in Idaho and other places. And he had visited Boyle Heights and was like, this is the first place that he felt like seen where he felt like there was the American and the Mexican side of himself, both, both integrated there. And the more that he learned about the community, the more that he realized like there's so much rich history and activism here yeah. that it, that is exciting to explore and to look into and then when he was looking for a writer to to create the show with him was looking for someone who had roots in the area and my 
parents immigrated to East LA into that area. Most of my family grew up there. And so I grew up going to in Mercadita. I grew up going to Royal Heights and listening to the mariachi. I grew up going to the park and like Holland Big Park and all those things. And so for me, it's like, you know, what he was experiencing was something I had always had already experienced growing up. I knew that that was a part of my, you know, part of my heart and part of something that I loved and part of my culture and my, you know, my family's legacy. The, that's where they came from. Yeah. So that's where I came from. Same thing. I mean, I have a lot of friends that are from there and I'm, I'm a you know native Californian myself. So I've been through Boyle Heights a million times and it's just nice to see it um, be showcased where people can look at it and they can see it. It's a living, breathing neighborhood and the people there love their neighborhood. And like you said, yeah. the activism and fighting for it, it's, it's exciting for me, again, as another character to watch that city or that part of that city come alive. So I wondered how, yeah. it, how you two came to that decision, but now we ended just now we know. Okay. Yeah. So do you have any um, upcoming films or projects in the works? I do. Well, I mean, obviously, Hymns of I just dropped on Wednesday. You could check that out. Season two on Netflix. Um, and then I have, uh, oh, actually, yes. I, I just, Flaming Hot, which is the story. I, I don't know if that's going to be the official title, but I wrote um, a script called Flaming Hot, which is the story of Richard Montaigne, the creator of Flaming Hot Cheetos. Um, and he, uh, Eva Longoria directed it. It's in post-production right now and hopefully it comes out next year. But it's a beautiful rags to riches story of this man that people don't really know that well, but actually created the, the recipe for this or the, the created the idea and the marketing strategy around this product. And he was a janitor at Frito-Lay and he has just this incredible story of his childhood. He he just went from nothing to, to everything. And it's this really fun, like inspirational, but funny film in a lot of ways that like just showcases a really inspiring man and how he and his family kind of came to this. So I got to write that for Eva. And then I have adapted a book called I'm Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter by Eric Al Sanchez, which is a New York Times bestseller um, that I wrote for America. Well, I wrote I wrote it for anonymous content and macro and now Netflix acquired it and uh, America Ferrera will be directing that as her director, directorial debut uh, next year. And so that's something that we just finished a draft of and I'm super excited about because it's a beautiful story um, of this young girl who is a daughter of Mexican immigrants in Chicago. And it's about mental health. And it's about um, the loss of a sister of hers. And, and it's just like this beautiful story of this, again, another immigrant family, but this girl who is just like not the expected type of character that you expect from our community. So I loved, I loved writing her. I loved telling her story. So I can't wait for that film to come out. And then there's some exciting news dropping tomorrow, but I can't talk about it just yet, but it's a big announcement. Um, it's uh, kind of the next chapter of my career and I'm excited about it, but there's many more TV series to come is what I, I will say about that. Do you, do you ever sleep? Oh, yes, I do. I can't not sleep because I go crazy if I don't sleep. So I do sleep. <laughs> That's me. Yeah. I always like try at least, at least seven to eight hours because if not, forget it. I also try to make room for meditation and walking and exercise. Wow. I say that to all the college kids here because without all those things and family time, I see my family every Sunday and try to make time for fun and joy because work can work can take over your life if you don't, if you let it, like it'll definitely take over. So. Well, yeah. your, your, your transparency is extremely refreshing. And I'm glad that you just mentioned exactly what you're saying, the step you take time for you with all the stuff that's going on. You know, there is a point where you have to break and take time for you and the students need to yeah. do the same. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, like I was mentioning earlier, when you're a person who has grown up giving and giving back to, so a lot of the themes of the show are very much based on our lives, you know, Marvin and ours and, and giving to your family and giving to those around you is a big, a big thing for me that I've had to learn how to give to myself as well, you know, over the, oh, in, in my journey. And I think, um, you know, that's, that's Anna, that's Eric in the show. And it's truthfully like a lot of it's based on my own journey of like having to learn how to balance the two and to uh, not sacrifice always for everyone else and, and give myself a little as well. So your self-care, your self-love, your, your, um, your own healing is, is first and foremost and is really the thing that's gonna help your family the most. Be the example that you, that you want, uh, be the example of the changes that you wanna see in your family because you can't control your outside situation. You can only control yourself. So that's why I do those things. I think that's a 
perfect note to end on, actually. I think that's a, a lovely way to end the conversation because back up a little bit. Yeah, you're right. That is a lot of Anna in Hentified, what you just described. But I, I think focusing on yourself and giving yourself time and allowing yourself to say no to others so that you can say yes to yourself. I, I think that's a, a great way for us to end this for students or anyone who's watching this to realize, you know, you could be as influential or as successful as Linda and still say no to other people. Yes, God, I'm still learning to say no, but yes, <laughs> do it. <laughs> no, 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 but yes. I want to thank both of you, Linda and Anne. Thank you so much. Okay. And, and this yeah. concludes our program today. So once again, really, this was awesome. So thank you, Linda. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I hope to see you back here in the spring for another conversation with another influential voice. So we are concluding this event. And all I can say is be safe out there.